This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 644 of the Dressage Radio Show, official podcast of the United States Dressage Federation on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, Arena Saddles, The Murdoch Method, and Total Saddle Fit. On tonight's show, we have Adult Amateur Grand Prix Freestyle National Champion Lucy Tidd. Then, Wendy Murdoch shares her experience at Equine Affair. Linda helps us review Rider Plus Horse Equals One. And then we'll bring you a great trainer tip. Reese Koffler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Rockwood, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show. Well, happy Thanksgiving to all of our American listeners and to my American co host, Reese. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just in case, hey, I, happy just in case anybody, everybody. you know, didn't know who my American co host was. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, do you have another American ghost I should know about? <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful week. And um, so we're actually, we're going to spill the beans. We're actually recording this a week early um, because we record on Thursday night. And as much as I love Phil and Paul I, and you guys, uh, I, I'm going to be enjoying a little bit of downtime with my family. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. So we were organized, Phil, this year and, and got to do a, a full show which is great. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we've still got some people to interview from the national championships, of course. And, uh, you know, we have Wendy, our monthly favorite guest. And, you know, we've got lots of great stuff going on this show. Yeah, exactly. Well, I hope you guys are, um, I'm not going to lie, my favorite thing of Thanksgiving. I actually love Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. Um, But I really love uh, the pumpkin pie the next day for breakfast. (laughs) It's like my favorite. (laughs) It's so good because you're like, oh, I get pumpkin pie in my coffee. Oh, it's just, it's exciting. I'm, I always really look forward to that pumpkin pie. I always take, my mom out, always gives me an extra couple pieces so that I have it for breakfast the next couple of days. So I'm not going to yeah. lie on that one. Sounds gross. What? Oh, yeah, come on. Like, pumpkin pie like is pumpkin delightful. Like smells. I don't like the way it tastes. Nah. What? Oh. oh, everybody. Philip is just no fun, obviously. Oh, it's the best, Philip. Uh, so, but I, there is a debate in our house. We also have a, and Phil's been there. We have a really cool apple orchard right down the street. And I was like, for years, I was like, I would go, I would get apples. I would like make my pie. And finally, my brother-in-law spilled the beans that his favorite pie is Evan's orchard apple pie. <laughs> so that was the end of me making any pie. I was like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm just going to go. order it. Yeah. I'm like yeah. making a note right just now. Like pick order. it up. Yeah. Yeah. I order my pie. I go pick it up. I'm like, do you like the one with the caramel drizzle or not? And so I always ask him and some years it's different. So I always check it out. So this year he wants the original one and they are really good. I'm not going to lie. So I, I have, I've quit trying to uh, Im- impress anyone. And I just run down there and grab a pie on Wednesday. It's freshly made. It's delightful. So, so we have pumpkin and apple pie and I probably have a slice of both. Bill, don't judge. Me. I'm not judging. So. I'm not that kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> it's the carb holiday. It's the best holiday, especially somebody who, you know, I love me a carb, but I don't eat as many as I'd like. So yeah. So it's the best holiday. It's excited. <laughs> so uh, and actually my sister and I usually my favorite Thanksgiving memory is my sister and I would ride together on Thanksgiving morning. Um, and so we would always go on a great big hack and my dad would come out and take pictures and it was always really fun. So, um, we do try to do that. I, I don't know if this year it's going to happen. Um, cause we have family in town. So, uh, but we do try to go on a family hack and it's really fun. So yeah, that's what we do. And then we cool. go eat in the afternoon. Yeah. Cool. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see my family. So it'll be fun. Cause I, I am not going to be able to get home for Christmas. So, uh, this is sort of my opportunity to see everybody. So. Well, we've got a great show, so we're going to get this party started, and uh, I hope you enjoy our guests, and we're going to have a quick commercial break from Kentucky Performance Products. This Nutrition Minute is brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products, the company that simplifies your search for research-proven nutritional supplements at kppusa.com. 
Have you heard of Saccharomyces boulardii? It's a yeast, a type of probiotic. Often referred to as S. boulardii, it benefits your horse's digestive tract in several different ways. One unique property of S. boulardii is that it supports the stimulation of something called brush broader membrane enzymes that are found in the intestinal lining. These enzymes help your horse digest starches and sugars in the small intestine. When the sugars and starches are more completely digested, fewer of them escape into the hindgut where they can ferment and cause imbalances that lead to colic, diarrhea, and laminitis. Saccharomyces boulardii is found in Nalox Advance, made by Kentucky Performance Products. Nalox Advance contains a blend of yeast, fermentation solubles, and stomach buffers. These ingredients work together to maintain your horse's digestive tract in peak condition. Nalox Advanced is recommended for horses of all ages and stages and is fed on a daily basis. This Nutritional Minute has been brought to you by Kentucky Performance Products. You can find all of their terrific products at kppusa.com. Well, tonight I am so excited to have Lucy Tidd. She is a friend of mine. We have been developing horses together for a long time, and her horse, Ellert, won in 2013 the adult amateur training level and first level U.S. national finals. And this year in 2021, she and Ellert won the adult amateur Grand Prix freestyle. So Lucy, welcome to the show. We love your story. Oh, thank you. So fun to be here. Well, we met, um, we were both, I think getting ready for the six-year-old championships is when that summer is when I really met you guys and got to meet Ellert as well. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and about him. Sure. So, um, so I'm a small animal vet is my real job. Uh, and then yeah, I have a, a farm in Maryland as well and the horses, are definitely, you know, my my huge hobby and and take up pretty much all of my free time. So um, I've been lucky to kind of juggle both of those things. And um, as time has gone by, I've been fortunate to be able to start to buy young horses and and kind of learn that process of of bringing them up and along, which is what I did with Eller. He was actually my, my, the first horse I actually went shopping for. And I had a lady by the name of Belinda Narn who went to, Holland and found him for me as a three-year-old. He was just a week under saddle when she looked at him and shipped him over. And he got here and was completely a terrified mess. Um, I'm not quite sure how he got started, but he was, you, you touched him and he shook. Um, and so it took quite a bit of time and getting on him was a little bit of a production for a while. Um, he was really worried about that. So he definitely just, took just some a, time Sorry, just to jump in. I yeah. just want to jump in. Why did yeah. your friend go over to Holland and buy you this horse if this is not a well-started horse? Well, she she was actually somebody who that's what she does professionally and was recommended to me. So she had a wonderful reputation for finding really talented horses. And I wanted a young horse. And so because that was my best chance to find something quality that I could afford. So she was very upfront about, you know, hey, this horse is just just started you might want to send him away when he gets home um that sort of thing so i definitely knew what i was getting into you knew that and you had a a, yeah had a a plan uh, yeah i had a plan plan for it yeah i I, I didn't think he'd be quite as as um i think he got dragged out of a dutch field and somebody flat tack on him and off they went and he was worried um they do nothing naughty they do do that. Yeah. It's, it's been a learning experience with buying horses in Europe, young ones. So he was three when he got here and um, promptly fucked me off pretty badly. Um, and so I had a, a local guy who was good with young horses, ride him a little bit for me until he felt a little bit more confident. And then we, we started working together more seriously and then worked our way up that first year, qualified to go to Kentucky um, and training in um, first level. And actually, it's a little bit of a funny story because I qualified at training and I, I was sort of debating, do I want to go all the way for one test on a young horse in November in Kentucky and by myself and have any help? And I decided, okay, I'll go. And I was like fifth on the list for first level. And so the chances of it rolling down to me were not very high. 
but the morning of that test, I was hand walking him. I was like, oh, I should just stop in the office and just, just double check, just in case. So I stopped in the office and the secretary is like, oh my God, we've been trying to reach you for days. There's an opening in the class. You can ride if you want. And this was eight o'clock. I hadn't ridden the horse at all. We got in there the night before and the ride was at like 10 something. And she oh said, we can gosh. put you in a drag break if you want to ride. And this was the first day. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> so, right. Here we go. There you go. Why not on this very, um, yeah. <laughs> young horse so i i was like all right well i, I got a, a friend of mine who was there to lead me around and uh, eventually got brave enough for her to let me go it warmed him up and um went in and um and won the test which uh, completely floored me and then uh, our official ride that i knew i was riding was the next day the training level ride and, and he went out there and just knocked it out again i was just completely stunned um completely not expecting any event it was the inaugural year and so really really cool experience with him and yeah he was just a superstar about the whole thing that is so I think it was cool. cold so, that year too wasn't it oh Great. so cold it's cold every year <laughs> Phil. It's it's cold. Cold. i mean i know you're canadian but when it was snowing <laughs> sideways on sunday i just kept saying why do we do this but it's yes mm. it was very cold and when lucy we saw each other hand walking quite a bit so lucy you must have yeah. a young one again because we kept running into I, each other in the morning uh, yeah i did i i laughed I, i'm actually supposed to have ankle surgery tomorrow i'm a, a bad warm blood with an ocd lesion and so i've been trying to sort of postpone this until after nationals and i do i brought a young mare a six-year-old mare who's pretty sharp and has never been there. And so we were looking at our phones and we were like nine, 10 mile days just walking <laughs> these young horses around the horse park. I'm like, <laughs> and we got there in the pouring rain, of course. So we couldn't get out around the rings to school around them the first day. And, and then it gets really limited on what you can do. And so, yeah, so I was, I spent a lot of time um, walking, choosing first level, walking, 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 <laughs> checking it all out. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I loved it because I kept saying, I kept seeing you. I was like, good morning. Hello again. <laughs> yeah. There's Reese again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, <laughs> you know, so tell us a little bit about going kind of back to Eller, how, you know, his development. I mean, he's, you've done so much work with him. It's not like you just went from the nationals in 2013 to Grand Prix champion. How did you tell us a little bit about the story in between? Yeah. So he, um, he had that that first great year, he was awesome. And then he, I showed him, um, I showed, I showed him and qualified him at second level. And he kind of hit a stage where, which I think a lot of young horses hit where he wasn't really testing, but he needed to sort of go bomb around and really sort of go forward. And he needed to start a little bit like his change work. And he has a, especially at the time, he had a pretty good buck in him. And I was afraid, and he made me nervous. In fact, we went, we won second level regionals. We went to Kentucky. I think we were almost last in our class because he got so just sort of balled up and stuck. And I was in this place with him where I'm like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to get him past this. I don't know how he's ever going to be a Grand Prix horse. I don't know how I'm going to get brave enough to sort of get him over the hump. I knew what he needed, but I knew for me that was going to be really hard for me to ride him the way that I knew he needed to be ridden because I, I knew that the chance of him being a little explosive was there and he's pretty athletic. So I actually had a, a young um, trainer. He rode him for a couple of years and did a good job just sort of kind of getting him going and getting him forward and, and kind of getting him his confidence up. And then I, I took the ride back on him a couple of years later and started doing a sort of fourth level pre St. George I won with him. I did well with that. It was a little bit of a transition for me because he's such a big moving horse. He's a little hard sometimes to put together. His his preference is to sort of just go big. And so for him to sort of learn the the shortness and the quickness to be able to release and the balance to really sit to, to do the FEI work well, took a little bit of time for him to develop that strength and coordination. And then we were, you know, as that was going on, obviously trying to start to lay the groundwork for the Grand Prix work as he got a little bit stronger with that. And then I did, he qualified for the developing Grand Prix as a 10 year old at his last year when I took him to Lamplight for that. And then last year, 
of course, everything with COVID, we, we did a tiny bit of showing, but not much. And it did a little bit, of, started at the Grand Prix. And then this year, we've just you know, continued to develop that. And it's funny for me because it's, he's my first Grand Prix horse. And so it's, it's all a new experience for both of us. So I'm learning it as he's learning it, which isn't always the ideal way to do it, but I've never had the luxury <laughs> of a schoolmaster. So it, that's what I have. And so I've been fortunate to have a lot of really good help. And so, you know, trying to work through that process with him has been kind of really interesting. And it, you know, it's such a big jump to hit the Grand Prix and you think, okay, great, you've made it. And then <laughs> you don't realize how much time it takes to kind of get it right. And yeah. I was at a clinic with Lars Peterson once and maybe last year and he's, we were talking about it. So I really, this is all new to me. And I feel like, I don't know all what I'm doing. And he was really sweet. And he said, you know what, for any of us, it, it takes you three years at the Grand Prix before you have any idea what you're doing. So that, that was pretty refreshing that, okay, it's not just me that it really is a slow process and it's so many little baby tiny steps to improve things versus, you know, as you're going up the other levels, there's a lot of like really sort of concrete, okay, you've learned a half pass, you've learned a pirouette or you've learned to whatever. And once they've learned all of that, now you're like, okay, now I gotta try and figure out how to make it good. And that's a very different mind switch, you know, for what I'm used to doing is I'm kind of bringing them up. I'm like, all right, this is it. There isn't anything else to learn. Now you just have to figure out how to make it better. And so that's been, that's been sort of an interesting process for me to, to try to figure out it's not good enough just to do it. Now, now we have to do it really well. <laughs> I'm laughing because yeah, that's every you know, Grand Prix rider, right? <laughs> like that's, yeah. That's yeah. It. I think you spend so much time, you know, kind of waiting for the horse to mature and then your goal is to to teach them the training pyramid, you know, and that's where that's where I think you kind of have your your big jumps because they they learn this about the training pyramid and they learn that they learn a little piaf or a little, you know, how to just yoga their body, shape their body and make them strong while you're waiting for their brain to mature. And then you got this horse and you can you can do, you know, all the movements. But then it's like, OK, now. Now, now the big jumps are done, just like you were saying, now the big jumps are done. Now I've got to spend another however many years to, to teach them how to how to really flourish within within the movements and, and within, you know, the Grand Prix stuff. So, yeah, it's challenging, right? It's a, it's a challenging mindset to just say, oh, you know, my 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 next year goal is is to do a flying change each way you know, that, that's a big thing, you know? And then you say, well, you've ridden the Grand Prix, like what's the big goal? Well, the, the, the big goals are done. It's just like, you know, how do I plan towards making the, the PF more on the spot and a little bit more active and, and all of that stuff. It's, it's like you said, it's a, it's a challenging mindset. That's why I like young horses, right? Cause you're just always like, okay, between this year and that year, you know, between this year and next year, I want to do from second level to third level. Well, now I'm working on the big stuff, right? Uh, no, it's, um, it, you really are getting in the weeds, which is it, it, it definitely an interesting place to be. And he's a, he's a super talented horse. And so I, I know he's capable of so much. And so I know the limiting factor is me to help him get to that potential. So trying to, trying to figure that out while he's still young and sound and healthy and um, trying to maximize that. Cause I don't, I mean, I hope I'll have another horse as talented as him, but they're, they're hard to come by. And uh, he's such a good egg, just a, a great work ethic. He really tries and he's just, he's so athletic that it's, you know, I kind of want to take as much advantage of having this opportunity to sit on this amazing animal as I can, because, you know, obviously none of us ever guaranteed with horses. You, you never know what you're going to get and how long you'll have them. And, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to maximize all of it and just take full advantage of the opportunity to be able to do it. Even just, even just to get to the Grand Prix, obviously it's, it's huge. You know, when I first got my scores to get my gold medal, I was, you know, <laughs> it's such a huge thing. So many people just don't, you know, through no fault of their own, never get the opportunity. So, you know, I had a horse get really close, but not quite. And I, I know it's it's so hard to do and so many things can go wrong. So you, you just sort of want to take, make the most of it when you're, when you're given the chance. 
for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you say this and, and, you know, but you went, you know, there were some problems in there and then you had to step away from him and, you know, as an amateur and just to, to send him for some training because maybe because of his athleticism, you know, he, he had an explosiveness to him. And, you know, I just wonder if you could, you know, f- reflect on those times to give, you know, to give people who are going through that at the moment, a little bit of, a little bit of hope to that, you know, it'll be okay. And, and again, I think that comes down to sort of the horse's mental maturity and, and, and it's okay to have have somebody else ride them for a year or two and get them through that because, because the result is really, I mean, obviously worthwhile and, and, and has worked out rather than just saying, I just don't, I don't know if this horse is going to work out. You must've had a lot of a sense of trust that it, it would work out in the end. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I adore the horse. He's, he's, he's just such a sweet guy to have around. So, you know, selling him was not really an, uh, something I wanted to do, but, but he did. He, he frightened me, you know, he got me off, actually got me off in the show ring at regionals one year because <laughs> some yeah. kid ran down the yeah. fence line with a dog in the woods yeah. and he saw it and he was tight and Oh, bucks me right off. Went like, great. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, he did. He did. <laughs> As I had to run out of the ring to go get on my other horse for its finals class. I'm like, oh, uh, catch him. I got to go. Somebody <laughs> catch him. I can't handle him. I don't want to deal yeah, with him. Paramedics are chasing me down. I'm like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I got another ride in 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no time. And I didn't. That's no when time. I met him. I'm fine, really. Yeah. And he I was kinda. athletic. I, I also yeah. had an athletic six-year-old. They, they were the same age. And, and oh my, I mean, he was super athletic. And and I can see why it was good for you to step back. And and I don't think that yeah. it's okay to do that. I think that's also where you're going with that, Phil. Like, I think it's I think, totally okay, yeah. yeah. You know, I got, I couldn't afford to go horse shopping until I was in my 40s. So, and I'd ridden all my life, but I'd never had athletic courses. It didn't even occur to me that they were going to act like this. You know, I was like pretty sure. naive about the whole thing. I'm like, of course, I'll just bomb around and they're not going to do anything silly. Or if they do, they're just going to sort of scoot in place and not like take off. Well, like, and some people Bronco. are like, well, it's, dr- it's dressage, you know, it's, you know, this is a dressage right. horse and this is dressage. <laughs> so, you know, it's quiet and but, safe and it's yeah. yeah. and yeah, all those things. I'm like, and it's definitely, especially the horses have been there. You know, the breeding has gotten so good. These guys are so talented. And, and I knew that it was like, I knew what the horse needed. And I knew that I was just going to hang on his face and shut him down. It's like, this is, it's not fair to him and it's not going to be productive and it's not going to get him where he needs to go. So it's better for me to step back and let somebody who, was much more confident and much less faced by that than I was get him through that stage, which having had a few of these guys now, it definitely that like five, six, seven year old yeah. stage. And I think it's definitely not unusual that they, they're not such scared babies anymore. They're starting to get a little bit more confident. They start to test a little bit. They, they just, some of them just hit this kind of weird stage and, and I know, I know my limitations with that, that I know I'm, I'm, you know, if I have to, I'll try to get through it, but I, I think it's better for everybody and better for the horse that they don't have somebody on them who is overly worried and is going to yeah. get in their way. Respect. Honestly, I think, you know, we try to say that too on the show. It's like, that's okay to step back and say, oh, for, for six months a year or whatever it is, I'm going to let somebody else do it get them going because really the bigger site, like you said, was to be a Grand Prix horse and Grand Prix horses will have that. They have to have that spark to be good. They just yeah. do. Yeah. So, so yeah. fast forward and, and, to your, yeah, and, they, and they, they don't grow on trees and they're, they're yeah. unaffordable, yeah, they do. you know, if, yeah. if, if at a certain point they become unaffordable because yeah, they're rare, right? They're rare. Yeah. And it's rare. Yeah, they are. I mean, I some really very well-known people have tried to buy the horse from me for a lot of money. I'm like, and I'm like, there's no, I could never, I could never guarantee that I could replicate this. There's just not a yeah. chance. So yeah, they're, they're so hard to, yeah, you guys know they're so hard. Even the old broken yeah. ones are really hard to come by. So yeah, to have one like that, is such a treasure that you, you kind of want to do that. And now it's great. Having done all of that, I had to laugh. My trainer at home had a, a young rider who qualified for the equitation finals 
a lap flight last year and she needed a horse. The horse she qualified on was really, it was pretty old and rickety and they didn't want to take him all the way to Chicago. And so though you can borrow, borrow Allard. And I tell you what, that horse went out there and was just, did not put a foot wrong. He looked so earnest about it. He took the whole thing so <laughs> seriously. I was like, uh, my heart was like, <laughs> and, oh, <laughs> it was such a proud mom. He was like, just you could just see him being so careful oh. and he'd never been at a group class i'm like okay well we'll <laughs> see how this goes and he was like he was just an absolute angel oh, for her that, like, you know that is was, so sweet it was so sweet i was so proud of him i was like oh, and it was a thousand know, degrees and those kids are out there for hours forever forever ever. <laughs> he was just like he's like do 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 okay <laughs> you know and I yeah he and so for me you know knowing what he he was like as a young horse and how hard it was for me to imagine that he would ever get <laughs> to that point you know I think he's it was so worth just taking the time and maybe taking a little sidetrack until I felt like he he was at a place where I was going to be comfortable with him and you know he was going to be secure enough to, to kind of go out and do his job without being too overly reactive oh that makes that makes me yeah. happy because i was with him with you guys as a six-year-old at lamplight and your horse and my yeah. horse were not doing that <laughs> no, we were like no hold them <laughs> like, yeah hang on <laughs> yeah just getting Very on him insane. was like yeah a production so a yeah challenge yeah <laughs> so yep, yep. Cool. we yeah. had the same we like the same horse so oh i love it yeah. i love it well yeah lucy it's so thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and winning the grand prix freestyle just just for our last question what was that like for sure. you that is amazing it was amazing i mean i you know I, I was I had always sort of had it in the back of my mind. It's like when I get that horse to Grand Prix and we get qualified, hopefully to go to finals. I mean, I knew the regular Grand Prix would be more than a bit of a stretch this year for us mm -hmm. to to win that. I was like, you know, he had a really good go at regionals and a really strong score in the freestyle. Like, you know, if we can get somewhere close to that, we might, you know, we'd at least be competitive. And so. You know, his Grand Prix test was, was fine, but needed to be a little bit sharper, um, which is usually where he needs to work on things. And so I, I just like, you know, I'm just going to go out there and go for it. And if we make a mistake, then we make a mistake. It's fine, because if I don't try to really go for the expression, you know, it's definitely not going to happen. So I thought I'd be a little bit more nervous, but I was like, you know what, we're just going to go out there and have fun and try and stay on the music and trying to go through this and, and just enjoy the experience and yeah I was like just you know nail biting at the barn waiting for the scores <laughs> to come up and seeing where everybody was gonna land so yeah I was just like definitely a dream come true and I didn't think it was very likely that it would happen so it was just yeah I was so excited it was like that would be so cool if he actually managed to win it and especially having one here in the beginning as a yeah. baby and to come yeah. through that whole process and get here it was just yeah just an incredible experience well I was excited because I know a little piece of your journey and I just I just it made my heart you know it just I was excited yeah. for you but yeah. We can't wait to continue watching your success and seeing how, how you guys develop even further. And we're just so thankful that you were able to come on the show with us tonight. No, yeah, well, thanks so much for asking me. Yeah, really fun. And yeah, fingers crossed, you know, we're, yeah. We're I want to see you back next year for that, that Grand Prix, girl. That yeah, Grand Prix absolutely. champion next year. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And maybe we'll make it out to Lamplight. <laughs> yes, I would Keep love swinging, it. Keep swinging, that's for sure. Keep swinging, Keep swinging girl. Yep. Yeah, well, have exactly. a happy holidays for sure. <laughs> yeah, you guys too. Thank you so much. The Horsemanship Radio podcast is dedicated to the advancement of great horsemanship throughout the world. Monty Roberts often stops by to present on this podcast, hosted by his daughter and legacy strategist, Debbie roberts Laux. The show includes segments, tips, and interviews exploring effective training centered on the well-being of the horse. This multiple award-winning podcast has 1.6 million downloads to date. Horsemanshipradio.com, sponsored by Hands-On Gloves and Monty Roberts University. Well, we are so excited to have Wendy Murdoch of the Murdoch Method on. She is our favorite monthly guest. <laughs> Wendy, welcome to the show and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Boy, this year has gone by fast, hasn't it? 
I was just going to say that. I was like, I feel like we were just talking in February in Florida. So yeah. it has, and you have had quite a year. So are you going to get a little break for the Thanksgiving holiday? Oh yeah. We'll, we'll um, have a really nice dinner. There's a local joint down the road. Actually, it's very nice. And Brad and I are going to go there for dinner and we're just going to chill. And, you know, so we take it pretty quiet around here for Thanksgiving. It's kind of like our holiday to chill which is really nice. I love it. It's my favorite holiday. I'm not going to lie. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. You just get to eat and watch the Macy Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> and I just love it. Are it's they having the parade this year? I guess they are. They are having the parade. I missed it last year. <laughs> so yes, it's. I just like to have my, my coffee and watch the parade and do the horses. So I'm excited you guys are going to have a, a lovely break because you just came back from Equine Affair in Massachusetts, right? We did, and um, and we're sandwiching Thanksgiving between Equine Affair and the American Association of Equine Practitioners, AAEP for short, trade show and uh, conference that's going to be in Nashville. So it's nice to have a little break in the middle because it's, it's pretty full. Oh, I, I like Nashville. Yeah, that's the yeah. Somewhere. Phil really likes Nashville. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Well, Music City. Yes, it's exciting. <laughs> but uh, Equine Affair in Massachusetts, we got. You know, the, one of the things about that show is. You never know what the weather's going to be because yeah. it started out, it was this beautiful 70s, and then it turned around and it pounded rain. I mean, pounded down rain. And I was so lucky because I had two demonstrations on Saturday and there was an hour in between, and that was the hour it rained so that my oh. riders weren't soaking wet when they came in the arena. But but I had an amazing time. I did two demos and two uh in the small arena, one for Surefoot, one for Balancing the Rider, and then I did two in the... Uh, Young Building, which was where my booth was on um, jumping and then on the flat. And it, it was it was packed. It was so people wanted to shop. Believe me, people wanted to shop. And a lot of the vendors actually didn't make it. I'm not sure why, whether it was supply chain problems or whatever. But um, so the vendors that were there were thrilled. I mean, people sold out of books and everything because, you know, everybody was, I think they're stocking up for Christmas. But um, I did my jumping demo, which was the first one on the Saturday. And and it was packed. Every bleacher seat was taken and they wrapped all the way around the arena on the other, on the open side. And, um, and I asked the audience, I said, you know, what's the, one of the biggest problems with riders? And they said, looking down. And I was like, I got a fix for that. <laughs> So cool. <laughs> Tell us about this. I'm so dying. Is this, is this the first time you've you've demoed the the glasses in public? Yeah. It oh, really okay. Is. Cool. Cool. And yeah. so you know, when I just asked, "What's the biggest problem?" They said, "Looking down." I didn't prompt them at all, but they it was such a perfect segue. And I pull out my glasses, and I had this really great great rider on a horse named Miles um, Ariana, and she's young. And she came in there and, and I could tell she wasn't quite sure what she was getting into. Of course, no one ever knows when they come in my demo <laughs> arena. <laughs> a point and I of pull ride up, for you, yeah. Oh my God. This, if if you ride for me in a demo, it's because I'm I entertain the audience, believe me. I make them stand up and do things. Because if you just let them sit, you know, yeah. it's like but anyway, that you know, they said looking down. So I pulled out my look up grass glasses and I handed them to her and she looked at me like, really? And I was like, yeah. And she put them on. It was instant change. Instant change. So she cool. looked up, the horse got round. And I mean, it just was, it was amazing. And of course, I wasn't watching the rider because I'm still talking to the audience. And so this is happening behind me. And I didn't even realize it. And then I, I um, mentioned that my booth was in that building and just behind it was just behind a petition, so um, you couldn't see it directly from the arena. And the demo was an hour and a quarter. And as I'm continuing, you know, Brad, my husband, is at the booth by himself. And <laughs> when I got back to the booth at the end of my demo, he was like, oh, MG, you wouldn't believe what happened. He said it was like a tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> people just swarmed from the arena went through the little gap which is turned the corner and we're at the booth and we sold out in about five minutes i mean people were buying three and four pairs of lookup glasses it was crazy um and and i you know i usually when i pack for these things i overpack i bring too much stuff and so i was looking at i have a tub of lookup glasses and i was looking and i was like oh i'll just bring a hundred it was 100 or 200, 100. I'll just bring, a, you know, because I don't want to pack the whole tub. It's a big tub. Where am I going to put it in the vehicle? Anyway, I should have because it was just, we were sold out and then everybody kept coming over and they were asking about them. But we had a couple of pairs that we could 
put on people. And then we put a special button on my website just for the anybody to help them find the lookup glasses quickly because it was just an instant hit. It was what I knew would happen if I could finally get this product to market. And it's taken me, I, I don't know how many years, more years than I want to talk about. Um, yeah. So tell us about the product. So basically, you know, the telling somebody to look up doesn't work because they don't notice that they're looking down. Right. I mean, you're not right. looking down to make your instructor's life miserable and you're not looking down to put your horse on the forehand. You're looking down because you're trying to retrieve information and our eyes are the the primary organ. Right. They're our biggest sense. So we're looking to see where our horse's head is. You know, is it down? Is it up? Is it is it going left or right? But the problem is when we do that, we're not using our feeling sense as much as we should. And in riding, we know we should be feeling, but when we can look down, we'll check our diagonals, we'll check our leads, you know, instead of actually being able to feel it. And so, well, what the, and I think, sorry, Wendy, I'll just jump yeah, in, but I think it's like, it's, it's a point of focus. It's, and even if you're not like consciously being aware of, of, you know, that you're looking at your horse, it just, it's just a natural kind of thing that happens. Yeah, uh, to absolutely. everybody, right? Yeah, because yeah, it's and, hard to kind of look where you're going and also concentrate on all these other things that that we're trying to. Uh, so, so it's just kind of a point of uh, unchanging focus, right? If you're looking around yeah. the arena for the letters and stuff, there's you've got to be a little bit conscious of that, and you know that's that's an extra thing to put on your plate. So people just tend to focus on the back of their horse's head, and that's a it never that's a changes. really good it, point. Yeah, I yeah. hadn't even thought of that as a as a constant while other things are moving around you because you're on a moving horse. That makes all the sense in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what the glasses do, and they're red. I love the red color. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is they have yeah, a... Wasn't exa so I saw a picture and it's the first time I've seen the glasses and it's like, I wasn't expecting them to be red. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the, the the bigger plan once we get a little further down the road is to bring them out in different colors and sparkles and, you know, because Love people it. like bling. We might as well have yes. bling, but right now they're red. And so they block the vision on the bottom half and the top part of the lens so that you have this horizontal slit to look through. And it's just at the height that your eyes just, to look through the glasses, you've got to look ahead that looking down, there's no value. And so once you take the value away, in other words, when you look down, you're not going to see your horse. You look through the glasses and of course, then you look up and it changes the horse's balance. And I did a video clip once, it was a while ago, and this woman was on a very nice dressage horse and she was cantering and it was a little bit on the forehand. And I just handed her the glasses and the horse came up in front like instant instant because it changed her balance it brought her upright and you know your head weighs 10 to 20 pounds so when you move that 10 to 20 pounds even a little bit forward it's going to put more weight on the horse's forehand so you know whether you're jumping and i you know this was a jumping demo and i had them going over poles in the glasses and i've had people jump but you obviously want to get used to them before you start going over a course right you want to yes. wear them and make <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. cool good idea right I, I'm, not, cool. I'm, I'm not going to be doing that but okay <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I will not be jumping anything, so it's fine for us. Right, right. You guys are fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it just it just changes the balance. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that we all know we do, but we haven't had a simple solution to solve it. And from the moment I made these glasses, and I actually made them originally to help people understand that the horse's uh, pupil is horizontal and that with a horizontal pupil, when you're trying to see something near you, like going through the corner of an arena and trying to look in the corner, you have to tilt your head in a really weird way to line up your horizontal pupils to be able to see the object. So that's really the origin of the glasses. I, I did a, a workshop with Dr. Stephen Peters and he was talking about horses' eyes. And I was like, how can I help people understand what that's like? And that's when the first generation of lookup glasses came about. And then I started put the, putting on, on, on people and I put them on my Surefoot Balance Trail, right? Because they would want to look down at the pad. So I would put the glasses on. And then it finally dawned on me, let's put this on a rider when they're on a horse. And OMG, it was like, why haven't I been doing this all day long? But, you know, sometimes it takes takes time to kind of work through that process to to realize the value of what you have. And people have even pointed out to me that, like, when if you're working with a dog, the tendency for the handler is to look down at the dog, but it blocks the dog. So, 
there may be other markets for my lookup classes. I love well, it's, it. It's always evolving, isn't it? It always is evolving. It's <laughs> absolutely always evolving. And, um, and that's the fun part, you know, because I've always been looking for simple solutions to things. There's high tech stuff that you can get, but you have to set it every time and it's electronic and you have to think about it. And this is just simple. You put them on, it's instant. You just look up because there's nowhere else to look. And so when the people were coming to my booth, we'd put them on the surefoot pads and then we'd hand them the lookup glasses so they could feel the pads and stop looking down. <laughs> Amazing. So I've got the question of the day where do we find the lookup glasses? How do we get them? Okay, so they are on the MurdochMethod.com website. And what we did is on the homepage, right at the top of the page, it says Equine Affair Attendees, but anybody can click on that button and it takes you directly to the lookup glasses. So we wanted to make it, once I ran out, I was like, oh my God, I got to make this simple for people to find. And it's in the training aids, which is the appropriate place, but there wasn't an easy button. So we put one right up on the top of the homepage at MurdochMethod.com. Fantastic. Well, Wendy, as always, we love all your products and all of them are on MurdochMethod.com, right? The Surefoot yep. Pads, the Surefoot Franklin pads. Balls. Yep. The Franklin Balls, that was another big hit. <laughs> They're great. I as use them know. today. I use them today. I love them. I love them. I can't wait for the look up glasses. <laughs> yep. Yep. And we're we're almost there with the hay soaker. You got to see it, but hopefully the next time we talk, we can say that it's ready to go. So we've been okay. still tinkering with it and making um, little minor improvements and making sure everything's really right. And we've realized, actually, that was one of the things we realized when we were up in, in New England is that we need to have a... Um, a winterizing kit for it, which we've already designed so that you can buy that and, and we can install it for you if you're going to be in cold weather, because we're like, you know, um, what if somebody doesn't have a warm room to put it in? How can we keep yes. it from, you know, outside? So we've actually, you know, again, it's one of those things, it's a process and we were up there in New England and it got cold. And I said to Brad, you know, we need to winterize this. So we've already figured out how we're going to do that. And people can add that on when they order it, when, when we're ready. So cool. So cool. Yep. Well, Wendy, as always, thank you so much. And we can't wait to talk to you next month. Yep. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And um, we're excited to go to AAP. That should be awesome. And um, I'm, I always look forward to talking to you guys. It's always fun. So we always fun. love having you. Yay. <laughs> With classic elegance and unbeatable quality, it's clear why Arena Saddles are the premier choice for every discerning dressage rider. The comfort and style of a beautifully crafted arena dressage saddle will help you and your horse move together in perfect harmony while you're competing or training for the dressage ring. You'll enjoy unmatched close contact that will enable you and your horse to perform in rhythmic unison and catch any judge's eye. When you experience the ultra soft seats and knee inserts, a perfectly balanced seat, customizable rider support and extra protective cushioning, you'll see why arena saddles are known for their beauty, comfort, and practicality. Priced at just $1,599, the Arena Dressage Saddle is the saddle for you. Visit arenasaddles.com to view the full range of saddles available and find a retailer near you. Well, I am so excited tonight for our book club review, which we have now called an oral book report. We have Linda on the line. Linda is a horse radio network auditor, and, and that's how we, we found her, and that's how uh, you can uh, be eligible to review the book is becoming an auditor for the horse radio network. So, Linda, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I love having the opportunity to read this book. I know. And I just loved when you said, I'm doing my book report. I was like, that is so perfect. You, you, you are doing a book report. I love it. Well, Linda, tell us a little bit about you. Well, I am a uh, seasoned writer. I label myself an intermediate beginner. It seems like every time I get a hang of something, I always find something else that it's new to start over and learn. I have a wonderful partner in my handsome thoroughbred. He's an off the track thoroughbred. We've been together for three years now. And we've been studying dressage together, and I had another partner before him, another aged mayor. I've kind of been studying dressage for about five years. Well, that sounds fantastic, Linda. And I'd like, I'd like to ask you, like, how long have you been listening to the shows on Horse Radio Network and our show, and, and how did you become an auditor? 
Well, I really can't tell you the number of years. It's been quite a few. I became an auditor because I've always been a horse person ever since I was a young person. But my husband was working at a barn, working at the barn and managing it. And he comes home with all of this interesting horse information that I'm like, okay, how do you know this? And he tells me he's listening to this wonderful podcast in the Horse Radio Network. And I thought, well, that's not very fair. So he hooks me up and we became auditors. And I'd say maybe been five, six years ago, but we've never regretted a minute of it. And uh, they're my constant partners over at the barn and, and out on the trail sometimes. And I've really enjoyed being an auditor. Oh, yeah, we'd love I, I, hearing that. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah, I think there's an, a really great kind of Facebook community, you know, which you become part of. And, you know, people are just chatting about, the, you know, their their own situations and, and asking questions about about horses. And, and I feel like it's just a really positive space where, you know, the Horse Radio Network brings people together in, in, in a great way. Yeah, I never hear any negativity, and there's always something to learn. I've never felt alone around all of these people. You know, you feel like you have so many friends that you've never met. But, yeah, it's really great. I like it. I love it. Well, we are going to now move into our book review or our our book report, which I love. So this (laughs) month we had Horse and Rider Equals One, How to Achieve the Fluid Dialogue that Leads to Harmonious Performance by Eckerd Miner. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the book. Well, I'll tell you, I'm one of those dog ear the corner, highlight page right in the margins kind of people. And this book is now very, very colorful. Um, (laughs) It's it's a very sturdy book. It's very sturdy bound. So it was set up to be used frequently as a reference material, not just something to set on the shelf. And I really see it as something that I will be using in our writing program here, just between my husband and I, you know, we moved to a private barn. We have to work a lot of things by ourselves. Our trainer is an hour away. Yeah, I can see us using this as a reference material a lot. It has very clear, concise explanations and exercises in it. It makes it seem very attainable for any level rider. And it's not set, I think, for beginning riders or advanced riders. There's even a portion in it that is set up that I think that instructors would find very useful in setting up a training program. And I thought, well, I won't use this part of it. And I started to just kind of skim over it. And then I realized, no, wait a minute, this is written in such a manner that I can use it to instruct myself with these things and to help my horse learn. So yeah, I was not familiar with this author at all. So I really enjoyed the opportunity to try something new. And I'm really, really glad I did. Yeah, I mean, I, I was the same way. I, I sort of maybe heard of Eckhart Miners uh, in, in passing, but not, you know, as a serious something that, I, that I've pursued. So because he does have a couple of books, and I think that he does more writing in German. So Trafalgar Square translated this book, as well as a couple of the others that we reviewed from German into English. And, and we we would have had him on the show, but there's there was a bit of a, you know, he said he couldn't, he wouldn't be able to give a deep enough explanation about the book with the English to German issue. So so we weren't able to have him on the show to explain his book. But, you know, the the, the book as it's written is, is quite self-explanatory. And w- what I like about this book is that it really focused on the rider and, and important aspects of becoming a good rider. You know, other books are written about how the horse should look or how, you know, how the horse should be or, you know, and, and there is that in it, but the focus was certainly on the rider. So all of the exercises were about the rider's biomechanics and, and how to how to prepare yourself for a good ride and, and you know, where you should be f- focusing your attention. So to me, that was 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 really important and and really good and and I think that somebody would get a lot out of this book and learning how to ride and learning you know where should their focus be and how, and how to use the the rider exercises you know even lots are off of the horse is really independent of the horse to 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 make themselves a better rider. Yes, I agree. There's a lot of those that I'm already started using you know here at the house. I'm kind of a not just. One of the writers says, okay, put your hands here, do this, move your leg here kind of people. I'm always asking, okay, but why? And this book answered a lot of those questions. You know, he he seems to explain how to do it and then the reason why to do it. 
And I really like that he explained why the trainings, there were a lot of questions in there that I was like, oh, now this makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I think that the the writing, you know, like some of the aspects were explained in in a different way than that I've heard them before. You yeah. know, so so that was really good. I mean, we're always looking as as trainers for different perspectives or d- different ways to to say something. And maybe that's somewhat in the translation from from German to English. So I have to give some credit to whoever translated this book. Oh, yeah. Um, Yes, to to make sure. it just just as simple to explain, you know, in in both languages, I'm, I'm assuming. But something that I really uh, focused on, and really, I actually wrote it down here that 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 he, you know, brought to light. And I've and I've heard this um, concept before, but I thought I'd just bring it to to our listeners because we haven't really talked about it. But he talked about the, you know, we we know about the training scale for the horses, but he talked about the concept of a training scale for the riders. Yeah. And so I'll, you know, I just sort of take this excerpt from the book is that the first step in the training scale for a rider is trust and fearlessness. So I think that's, you know, if, if you, if you're fearful, you can't learn and it's not going to go anywhere. So that's a good one. Suppleness and other, another word is sort of the relaxation of a rider. So it just returns, you know, back to that. And, and you have to be prepared and supple in a relaxed way to be able to ride the horse. The rider needs to have an independent balance and their own sense of rhythm so that the horse doesn't just take over and and you have to ensure that you're balanced and rhythmical. And then you have to have, uh, I guess what, how we put it is movement awareness. So you have to be aware of your own movement and also of the movement of the horse and how the horse moves. And and then the, the fifth step of a rider training scale was the idea of proprioception. I think I said that right. But just We're awareness getting... of your body position in space. So mm-hmm. that's like if you don't know that your that your hands are too far forward, for example, or that you're leaning this way or that, then you have to develop that, you know, an awareness of, of where your body is at on the horse. And then the sixth step is the rider's influence. And that is, you know, kind of application of the aids and your riding technique. So, you know, we got through five steps without even talking about riding the horse, I think. And that that's important, right? Yeah. Too many people are trying to influence the horse, apply the aids without the first five steps being established. And I thought that was really, you know, interesting in that, you know, you don't just get on and ride. You have to get on and develop all these things and then maybe you can ride. And I think that goes back to kind of the German system of, you know, you, you ride first on a lunge line, like let someone else worry about the horse because you need to you need to figure out all those other things. And then, you know, the 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 sixth step, I mean, you spend your whole life trying to develop, you know, the riding technique or, you know, applying the right aid at the right moment with the right intensity. And I tell my students, yeah. and even in the perfect situation and you apply all those things, the horse can decide to listen or not listen. So that's that's what makes our, our sport just so difficult because you can have the perfect technique, but you have you have to be communicating with another animal, which is moving, which might really, you know, block or uninfluence all the other aspects of, of your riding. So I thought just, you know, and, and, and that that was kind of a theme throughout the book is that you, you have to have all of these things connected before you can even have a chance of producing a perfect half pass, for instance. And and that, and that just brings it back to the idea that riding is really, really hard and you have to take care of yourself first and then you can yeah. and then you can do something else. And he talks about rider mm-hmm. fitness, too. I mean, there were quite a few exercises on how to handle, you know, being stiff or what's going on in your shoulders. My favorite one, it's it's a caption to one of the pictures, but it's a young, well-conditioned rider needs less time for warm up than an older, unfit rider. And I had to (laughs) laugh because I was like, well, yeah, you know, as you get older, you don't warm up as well. (laughs) Ain't that the truth, right? Yeah, I I had to laugh. (laughs) Uh, yes, very, very definitely. And I like you don't need a lot of equipment for the for the exercises. I mean, yes, he had right. some of the seats in the chair, but I have found an English saddle well placed on a good stand can also be a very appropriate yeah. for a lot of these. I mean, it yeah, I really, really enjoyed I picked the book. I, I picked up a lot of a lot of good information from this that I know I'm gonna be using, especially with winter coming on and 
I really liked his emphasis on warm-ups, not only for the horse, mm-hmm. but for the rider. My boys said that, you know, after I lunge the horse, the horse should stand in the middle and lunge me because I need that type of warm-up. But I really liked his emphasis on the warm-up. And also, he spent a lot of time with the walk. You really don't hear a lot of conversation about the walk. And sometimes with the weather and everything, a walk may be all I'm going to be able to do. And so I found a lot of exercises that I can use this winter that I'm not feeling like, well, I'm just putzing around. I'm actually working on something with the quality of the walk and changing everything within the walk. It's one of the things that I feel sometimes outside trainers. I I know my personal trainer does not really emphasize the walk and get to the trot, work on the canter, you know, but the walk for me is also very important. And so I I really was surprised and impressed that he actually had several pages on the walk. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a, a very German training style. We walked at least 20 minutes when we would, when yes. I lived there at least 20 minutes every day. And I, I walk a lot too, because Conrad Schumacher got to love him. He says, you're greasing the joints and it makes yes. sense. Cause that's, that's an old school way to think of it, but it's very true. And I think a lot of people that haven't been exposed to that, you know, they just get on and they start trotting and it's like, yeah. whoa, 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 we'll take your time. So, but it, I agree. This is actually a very good winter brook to read. And yeah. like you said, my, I also, mine is also very dog-eared, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I loved when you said that because that's exactly right. Like, you know, like Bill said, the training scale, I mean, they, literally almost every page, they had a really, really top, you know, talking about Ben versus flexion and what is that? And how does your body affect those type of, of, you know, concepts, which was really good. So Again, I will we'll say it one more time so everybody knows the book, but it's horse plus rider equals one, how to achieve a fluid dialogue that leads to harmonious performance by Eckerd Minor. And we have a new book coming for next month as well, which we're really excited about. But all the book club books are on our website. So you can see all the ones that we've reviewed and that Philip and I have picked out also with Trafalgar Square. So we really appreciate you coming on, Linda. And thank you for sharing your story. And good luck this winter working through the exercises. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be exposed to this wonderful book and for the opportunity to speak with you guys. It's been great. Well, Phil, as always, we really talked to everybody because it it came up again today about the stability stirrup leathers and how much we like them. I uh, I had a student come in. She she was a haul in from Ohio. She came. We do some of those kind of overnight camps or people come in for a couple of days, dressage boot camps. And I saw her stirrups because I always kind of look at that as an instructor. It's a good instructor tip too is like, you know, when you first see a rider, it's good to just kind of peruse the tack a little bit. And she had some really old stirrup leathers and uh, I told her about the stability stirrup leathers and how much I love them. And she is working really, really hard on her sitting trot. And I said, you know, this could really maybe help you is uh, having a little bit different stirrup leather. So uh, definitely something to think about. Good job, Reese, spreading the good word and helping people (laughs) out and helping people be more stable and more comfortable. We're both on that on a bit of a crusade about that, and I, we I, are. Think, <laughs> I think all the products from Total Saddle Fit are really great, and we can recommend them with with such confidence because of their quality build and and again they have money back guarantees on all their products. So I mean, people won't be put out if they order it and they don't like it. So I think there's no reason not to kind of you know make the make the switch to to a new girth or to the stirrup leathers. Uh, I think I. You know, people have such great experiences with them. They they never go back. Yeah, exactly. We won't go back. So uh, we highly recommend it. So check out Justin and his team at totalsaddlefit.com and uh, check out all their products. This week's dressage training tip is brought to you by Total Saddle Fit, home of the shoulder relief girth at totalsaddlefit.com. So Phil, we, it's you and me for the total saddle fit trainer tip of the week. And I think it's a really cool discussion. I'm not sure we've even ever talked about this kind of tip, but you know, we just finished the U S finals, you know, it's coming into the holiday season. Uh, so we wanted to talk about what do you do 
with letting your horses down after season? So, you know, kind of our, when our season finishes at the end of September or early October and uh, kind of winding down, there still is maybe a, a couple of weeks where we can do some some outdoor riding and it's quite pleasant. Um, but by by the time now rolls around end of November, then it's really not very pleasant to ride outside. And so, um, you know, we try to do some hacking or, you know, whatever. But basically, it's it's just time for our horses to be horses so they'll get increased turnout time and, um, you know, and, and, and they do look forward to the ride. So, you know, they still get lots of grooming and, and our, our massage therapist comes in as well. And, you know, they're, they're sort of in their same routine without a whole lot of, of work being involved and, uh, you know, kind of a pressure release. But, you know, what I noticed is that if we just, if we do nothing with them, they, they aren't happy, you know, th- horses really thrive on on routine so we try to keep the routine as you know the same as much as possible um like i said without without really working them or you know or we'll just do some stretch work or whatever so they're still happy they're not worried that they they're done you know that that we're not going to interact with, with them anymore they don't get their grooming and and all the all the great and the, and the treats they need their yes. treats so <laughs> yeah we don't let them just be completely out and and uh you know, because then they 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 worry and they they do weird things yeah. in their stalls and whatever. But uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's just a little bit of time to review what happened this year and uh, you know, kind of mentally with the riders and 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 uh, you know, on the successes and and maybe the unsuccesses and you know how it all went and and start kind of planning, looking forward to uh, at this point is twenty twenty two and and what 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 will that bring for us and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for us, a, a bunch of the show schedule for next summer is, uh, is coming out at this time. And yeah, it's just time to pause and reflect and, and, uh, and get some motivation going, read a, you know, yeah. read a dressage book, however, <laughs> you know, however you find motivation is what you should be doing and, uh, and thinking about moving on. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, kind of the same thing, you know, I'm very lucky because like Mike was at the U S finals for not even 48 hours. So, you know, I didn't have to travel His his life wasn't that interrupted, but we did give him, um, same kind of thing. He came home, he had the weekend off, uh, and Monday he just, he just hacked for a couple of days cause the weather was nice, but I'm, I'm with you. I, dressage horses don't seem to do great if you just set them free. Now, if you're an event rider, those horses are used to going on vacation for a couple of weeks, like here and there during the year, because they work them so very hard. And sometimes they do go on vacation. So um, they're used to it. But dressage horses, I found, you know, they, like you said, they just, they get weird. They, they don't like sort of not the routine. So I've even had horses where I tack them up and walk around for 10 minutes and take them back, you know, and that's for them a physical break, but mentally they have to have that sort of stimulation. So I'm with you. I I don't typically uh, give them that much time off, but I I will change the work or vary the work or not work them as hard um, or stretch them or hack them for a week or so. So that's kind of what we do. And then, um, I usually, my vet is awesome and, and we're getting ready for Florida too, but, uh, my horses get the shots the week of Thanksgiving. So they usually get shots like Tuesday or Wednesday. So then I don't feel too bad about taking a little bit of time off with my family because the horses aren't feeling so, so hot. So, uh, that's kind of the plan that we do. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I, us too, you know, they get their teeth checked and if they need, mm-hmm. you know, whatever else they need, they're, they're getting their, um, winter clips also. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, a lot of horses have to be sedated for that. So that'll be a project for a day. And, and like you yeah. said, the vaccines and getting caught up on all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just time for other things and that's fine. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Again, we, we say the same thing, you know, it's fine. They, they're ready for it you know, our horses showed quite a bit this season uh, and they've been going since, you know, this time last year or, or December, January last year. So I don't mind a little bit of downtime before we head south. So, yeah. So I hope 
everyone is going to have a great holiday and, you know, start, we're going to start talking about goals for 2022. So get ready for that discussion, uh, which is great. So we wish all your horses a little bit of downtime, everybody a little bit of downtime, get some out of the barn time if you'd like and uh, enjoy the holiday. Well, Phil, I can't believe it, but it's time to announce our next book club book. And we're really looking forward to this one. This one is going to be The Gates to Brilliance by Robert Dover. So it's his story on how he has been successful. Uh, I can't wait to get started. This is going to be my Thanksgiving. Uh, Hopefully this week I get a chance to read a little bit, but I'm looking forward to hearing Robert's story. He's such an inspiration for us all. So pick it up at horseandriderbooks.com, Trafalgar Square. Again, The Gates to Brilliance by Robert Dover. So I hope you all get it. And um, we're going to have hopefully Robert on the show to talk about the book during uh, close to the holidays. So we're looking forward to that. And as always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. I think the best way to find me is probably through Facebook or my email is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors for allowing us to put on a good show. That's Kentucky Performance Products, Arena Saddles, The Murdoch Method, and Total Saddle Fit. Don't forget to check out all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down, your shoulders back, and we hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon.